Today, we have a very special guest, um, New York legend, uh, lead singer and bassist of Sunflower Bean here on, to, on uh, It's Road Demi today. I'm actually a little nervous because Julia was one of the first front women of a band that I ever knew existed, um, not only in New York, but in general. And she's inspired a lot of girls, including myself, to uh, stand in front of a band and lead it. So let's have Julia come in. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you for such a lovely introduction. That is uh, always a very special feeling. Mm. So, what are you wearing today? Because you're also like a style icon. I honestly, I'm wearing a shirt. I don't even know what it says um, that my uh, roommate left at my house before she left. And I had my, these are like my, just my fun glasses, but which I have been enjoying wearing in the studio. I'm in our um, Long Island studio space right now, but um, the glasses, you know what? I'm just going to keep them on. Cause I feel yes. like they're I'm like on and off with the glasses. Definitely. Um, vibe. Yeah, no, I'm trying to like, I, I think I, in the summer, I love to wear jeans, which weirds everybody out, especially in New York, because it is so humid. But I feel like, you know, in the winter when we're wearing jeans, it's everything's covered up with a coat in New York. That's why it's so hard to, I feel like, look cool. So I'm always trying to get my good jeans looks out in the summer and everyone's like, what are you doing? So that's my I'm that's sure. my summer dilemma right now. I love long boots, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? And people think I'm weird for like wearing long boots but people don't remember that new york city is like you're walking around in like like a zoo like you kind of need yeah. to kind of covered up like this is not you know like you know the suburbs up in here well you need uh, to be you always i always joke that you need to be prepared for like every possible outcome you need like you need to have your sneakers your sweater your tank top your jacket um your you know you, can you guys see me yeah. yeah, you can do okay. one. We can do like that, so it's like oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So you basically just that you need to have everything um, at all times for every kind of like situation. Um, that's the New York way. And okay, so I really wanted to get back to the start of you know your band and you being a front woman because years ago I had a friend tell me that there was this girl who fronts a band, and I was like, no way! Like you know every you know, it's, I mean, I've actually never, just girls weren't doing that. Like I said, like a few years ago, like when, when stuff are being started, I feel there weren't a lot of front women. And can you tell me about kind of how that was for you to be kind of like almost doing that at such an early age and also how that kind of developed and, and seeing how that rock is back and all this stuff. Mm. How does that feel to be a part of it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think mm -hmm. when I think about um, women in rock, which is obviously like a, a term with a lot of weight. Um, you know, I often think about, um, the, the women in rock history, you know, there are these like huge icons, there's Courtney Love, there's Kim Gordon, there's Joan Jett, um, there's these big figures. And I think sometimes we take for granted how hard, um, they had to work at that time in that space um, to create that space for others. And I feel like every woman that has kind of been a part of that lineage um, really is making that space like person by person. You know, I think that the way that you live your life and what you decide to do with it is, you know, like, you, it, you know, you, you try to do your best. And um, in this case, I guess, lead by example, but you know, um, I, it's just really what I wanted to do. And, and when I think about um, being, being an artist and, and having freedom and the freedom to be the kind of artist that I wanna be as, as a woman, it's really about um, the freedom to make those choices. You know, like when I was um, starting to play music, I never, I wasn't really thinking ever that um, I was trying to uh, 
break a barrier. Yeah, or tr yeah, trying to kind of hold that place. I was really just trying to um, to live my life as a musician. I mean, I had a so I had a band before this band as well that was um, all all girls, and we started that when I was um, thirteen. So um, I started playing music and being involved in the scene um, when I was like a really early teenager. So a lot of the steps kind of just felt. Um, natural and a big thing in that in my first band was really about um like kids and girls having the right to make art and make music so kind of back then i was already kind of living uh on those terms so when it came time for us to do some I mean, it just it felt very natural i don't want to go too far back into the super cute days um but i'm curious how you chose bass and mm -hmm. Did someone show he put a bass in your hands? How did that come about? Were you a big fan of Sting? Like, where did that come from? Yeah, well, I um I've always loved the bass. I've always loved the bass uh in songs. It's always been a big part of being a, a music fan and a music listener. That was really important to me. Like I was as a kid, I was always listening to the bass in songs. And also because my dad um plays bass, both of my yeah, parents, yeah. my parents are really musical they met in a band and neither of them did music professionally with their jobs but they had many years of um, being obsessed with music playing music and um, they still are like we still talk about music all the time and, and songwriting and so my dad showed me a little bit of how to play bass um, all kind of like by ear stuff and like we would play before I went to school or we would like sing in the car together a lot and he was a big part of my, um, he's a big part of my musical taste and, and my musical um, upbringing. So when it came time to start Sunflower Bean, I played bass a little bit. Um, I played guitar at that point, probably a little bit more, but in like when, when I met Nick and, and Olive, like we were talking about, you know, Nick really wanted, I, I kind of, I was like, yeah, I play bass. I can definitely play bass. And Nick was like, you know, okay, let's do it. And I was actually really nervous because I do think that so many new musical situations can be, you know, you just never know what you're going to get. And I was, you know, a young girl and I did still feel nervous that, um, you know, I wouldn't kind of like fit in. And I think what was really great is that at that time, Nick was a bass player in another band, really trying to show the world that he was a guitarist. And Olive played saxophone and played a bunch of stuff, but she was really um, beginning to develop as a drummer. And kind of the three of us, I think, at that time had a lot to prove to each other and, and to the world. And we were just really lucky that we found each other and, and wanted to grow in that way together. You mentioned the scene earlier, by the way, which is like, it's crazy because people, a lot of people that aren't really like in New York like that, they say, oh, like the New York scene is dead and all this. it's been dead, whatever. But a lot of people don't know that there's like this crazy, like, tell me if you know what I'm talking about, like hardcore and like noise music scene for no reason mm -hmm. in New York for like the past, like fucking like seven years, like show me the body, like, you know, that are just killing it. Like I've seen that band go from, as well as your band go from like, you know, selling $5, you know, kids that's still out of basement to like Coachella and just big festivals and whatnot. And it's kind of funny, but do you believe that the scene is it? Because it, maybe it's because people aren't here trying to make hit records like they are in LA, right? But like music for radio, like maybe they're just trying to like make like noise music. But do you really believe the scene in New York is dead? And how can it be revived? Do you think? Yeah, I think you know there's a lot of things that go into it, and I do always kind of feel like it's a, it's a cycle. Um, you know, I do think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I love New York. Um, but I do feel that um, it is a, I mean, it's a particularly difficult time for, for artists. And I think uh, independent artists on the whole right now, I think it's extraordinarily difficult, you know. Um, and I mean, do, doing anything in the arts is really hard. But I think in New York, especially, I, I think, with what we're going through right now with like the rental crisis and all of the apartments sort of trying to come back from the um, from COVID and, and how low their rents had to be and just kind of the bureaucracy of the city. I do um, 
think it is very, very difficult. A lot of my friends, um, a lot of people that I know are really struggling to stay here. I think that um, the continuous luxury developments and uh, constant catering to um, the rich at all times and every single moment um, creates a very inhospitable uh, situation for musicians to actually make sound. You know, I think that's been a huge problem. That's been a real difference since when I um, started was just that there, you know, you could, you could play loft shows, you could play in a lot of different situations. And I do think that is like harder and harder to find. There's just like less places where that's, it's okay. There's nowhere else. There's also just nowhere you can play drums in New York city. That's why we've always kept our studio, you know, in long Island is not kind of having to deal with some of that stuff. But with all of that being said, I do think, you know, it's like, it's like you said, there's always artists like show me the body. There's always, um, scenes and that is what i think is the biggest thing about being an artist and being a musician is that if 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 people want to make music they're going to make music if they want to play music they're going to play music they're going to find a room they're going to find a warehouse they're going to find a venue you know it won't be it won't be stopped just because the circumstances are hard so i think that when people are feeling sad about losing a scene or losing a scene of a particular time it is an opportunity to ask yourself, maybe, maybe you're just not looking hard enough. You know, like there, there's always something booming in New York City if you know how to look for it and if you put the time into involving yourself in that scene. I think. I also think it's kind of a. Um, um, first of all, I I came from I, I've never met you in real life, but I've I've been at events that you were at that you were DJing or something like that, and. I came up to New York in 2015, 16 for the, you know, to do like music photography and documentaries. And I felt like I got like the tail end of that Bushwick, like sweet spot. Yeah. Um, but I do agree with you that I do think it's, it's kind of a cop out to say it's dead. I think it's kind of a lazy excuse. Yeah. Um, Cause there's always something new. Uh, Demi just played um, her band just played this cool, like pajama party thing at, you know, and, <laughs> You know, there's all these little like Lingerie. events and stuff. And coming, I live in LA now, and LA is so industry centric, and all these shows are industry showcases. They're run by, you know, you show up and it's a bunch of like record executives, and it's not a bunch of 19 year old kids, yeah. you know, in, in black clothes like it should be, you know. So, um, just there to like take a fucking photo, you know, yeah. what I'm saying or like show that they were there. It's weird. LA is yeah. weird there right now, but. So okay. I guess I guess Julia, like you've never had the the desire to move to LA because of the the yeah. kind of the the draining of the 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 New York DIY scene. I mean, I think a lot of times. I think also when your life is dedicated to a band, mm -hmm. you don't you're not really thinking in your own terms all the time, right? Like mo like most of my decision making. Um, for the history of the band is, you know, we do, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a family business, you know, it's like, if one of us goes somewhere, we kind of all have to go somewhere if we want to keep things going um, the way that they've been. So a lot of times it's just been about what is, what, do, what's our next step? What do we need to do? What, where are we trying to go? And, and for a lot of the past, um, like the, the years before the pandemic, I was just on tour, like, 100 150 nights out of the year so i didn't really live anywhere um i didn't you know i think now at this point in the pandemic um i feel way more like a new yorker probably the closest that i felt since like i was in, in high school or in school because i just have had so much time here and had to think about it um but i do i do i i mean i think you always want what you don't have and i do really like la um, I would love to spend more time out there. Also London. I would just love to um, travel more freely for musical projects. Yeah. You're also a model. Let's go, baby. And you have like the coolest style ever. I feel like you're, you, you actually love and are inspired by fashion, but can you tell me about how do you balance like modeling with your music? And did you ever have a moment where you're like, I'm just 
rocker girl and people see me in this light and i mean rock is almost like a thing of it's almost like a genre for the outcasts for the rebels and then here we have you know the fashion side of you which is like you're the it girl you're the center of attention you're you know what i'm saying so how do you kind of balance those two very different sides of yourself yeah i mean i think um you know the i always saw modeling um as I, I'd seen other people kind of do it and I saw it as a way um, to kind of give myself the chance to be an artist. I saw that it that it um, helped people um, if it worked out for them where, you know, just a kind of a, a different structured job that could give them, you know, more time to pursue these other things. And I actually started modeling um, kind of late in high school, but it was a lot of like catalog stuff and like e-commerce stuff, you know, front, side, back, whatever. And I feel actually like super, super grateful for um, a majority of those experiences that I've had in fashion because a lot of the time I was able to, like, especially working, you know, working with Hedy Slimane or, or being able to shoot with Steven Meisel or right. Pat McGrath a bunch of times and just like being around some of these people who truly are like, the best at what they do at such a young age, I think was, has been really amazing just to like be, be around their greatness. Like you learn so much from just seeing people who are, are truly our masters in that space. And I think I learned to develop a relationship with modeling where I do see it as like a performance, you know, it, it is very similar to me to a show except that you're performing to just the camera, to just one, you know, to one camera. Um, and being able to kind of, you know, not every shoot is like that, but the shoots where you get to be creative, um, you get to have input, you get to sometimes work with your friends and you get to develop this other artistic, beautiful world through photographs is like really a very special thing. And, and yeah, being able to, learn about clothes, learn about style, um, have, you know, access to a lot of, um, a lot of this fashion that I just wouldn't have had access to any other way. So, you know, I do feel like extremely like humbled and grateful for that experience. I think earlier in my career when, um, especially when I was doing like a lot of modeling and the band was happening a lot. I think that, um, and we just, the band wasn't like as big. I think that people um, sometimes thought like maybe that I was like a model who had just kind of decided to do music, um, you know, not knowing that I had been doing, you know, kind of been in clubs for a very long time with my first band, like just always doing shows. And I think to that, I always just said, you know, like, just come see the band, you know, like, um, I put really everything in, into the music and I feel like when you try to live authentically in that way that, you know, it doesn't really matter what people think, you know, it, it matters. Um, it only, it only matters, you know, being, being truthful to yourself and putting that out there. And, um, you know, that, that has definitely been, been my truth that these things coexist, um, in, kind of an artistic way. I I want to talk about the evolution of the of the sunflower bean sound. Um your first of all you have this new you have a new album out. Um it's been four years since you released a full LP. Um yeah. 2018 was your last album um, and fans will know that one is the one that um I was a fool. That's the album that I was a fool is on. Yeah. Um and uh and the new album first of all it's heavier. It feels more intense mm -hmm. than your previous albums. And I love that, you know, I, first of all, I love a, a front person who's also a bassist because they kind of prioritize the bass. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they're the bass is like really chunky and really like low end, almost like a Bootsy Collins kind of mm -hmm. sound on some of this. Yeah. So did you purposely, when you made this, this, this latest album, did you uh, make it with the intent of being a little more aggressive, a little more raw, a little more heavy? I mean, yeah, I think the um, the circumstances, you know, that that created it, it was definitely created during the pandemic. And I think that um, our interpretation of that was to try to create something that felt very um, 
kind of bombastic and and intense. You know, I think we felt like coming out of that time, there were going to be a lot of extremely introspective kind of dark records. And that's something we understood. And that definitely kind of weaved its way through the record. But I think we also wanted to do something that um, was kind of like yearning for like fun, you know, like, like a song on the record, like Stand By Me. I feel like it's very influenced by like the feeling of like being at Glastonbury, you know, or a song like Post Love, which is really kind of clubby, comes out of all the times that I was DJing in, in New York in dark clubs, you know, playing rock songs and dance songs and, and kind of trying to see what songs made the room react. So there's a lot of really personal relationships to live music and live events that kind of made its way into um, this really insular experience of recording the record. You know, a lot of it we recorded down here in this room, some of it in Greenpoint, some of it in Electric Lady, but um, the whole record was created in New York State, so I really like that. It's a New York album. Track yeah. with Roll the Dice. Is it I Just Wanna Win? Mm. What? Like, you, that's my favorite song from the whole album. Can you tell me about like the inspiration behind that track? Yeah, I mean, Roll the Dice is uh, is one of the most interesting songs on the record to me. I think, especially like tonally, it it really has this vibe that I just can't really like describe. It's like a very, it's this like kind of. It reminds me of like a being on a boat. It's like this like lurching, yearning, like grungy feeling that we that we got on it, and it was just like I felt like it was unique, and we really had to kind of protect it and that kind of weird long intro, you know, it's just a very special moment on the record that happens pretty early, um, pretty early on the record. And yeah, I mean, it was a big, a big theme on the record was um, kind of this feeling of like taking, taking a chance, taking a risk, um, making a change, um, really kind of feeling like so many things were out of control that it, you know, it did every every day kind of felt like rolling the dice and seeing what was going to happen. And also, um, I think trying to kind of tap into that headspace that I think um, so many people feel right now. And I think a lot of Americans feel right now, which is, you know, especially now that we're kind of in the beginnings of this kind of weird, sinister recession that's hard to figure out. Um, you know, just the fact that we're in dire times and that when you're in dire times, you're willing to take big risks to see what's going to happen. Like, you know, everyone uh, inflating the GameStop stop, GameStop stock and then, you know, using that money to pay off their medical bills. You know, it's like when you think about a lot of these circumstances that have become so normalized to us in the U.S., um, you know, there is a like comical and extremely heavy weight. Um, so I think that's kind of what Roll the Dice was about was, was, is, you know, how, how much are you willing to risk to go all the way or even just get to um, what you would consider safety? Let me talk about AOC for a sec. Hmm. Yeah. Like, you guys are closely, you know, you guys have been involved in um, a few things together and um, vouch for each other. So what's she like as a person, man? Very cool. I mean, I feel, um, yeah, super honored to have met her. When I met her, I actually um, hosted like the first, her first like speaking engagement when she was running for Congress. Cause I was, um, it was like in 2017 into 2018, I was doing a lot of, um, I was really focused on uh, speaking to a lot of this kind of like what was being described as like the new generation of women that were like women in their late twenties that were running for office mm -hmm. for the first time um, in response to uh, the Trump election. And that was a, it was really, really cool. And, and you know, me and my uh, partner who was running that project named Trevor found her on Twitter and was like, let's talk to her. And we did this event and nobody was there, you know, like 12 people were there. Um, my dad asked her like three questions and I remember both her and I, again, this kind of goes back into what we were talking about in the beginning, but we both, um, 
had like we we came to the event in like our whatever sneakers and then we both had like fancier shoes that we put on like we both put on heels to go and like do the conversation because <laughs> it was like yeah this is we both understood that you know we needed the extra pair of shoes and yeah i mean she got elected soon after and we were you know we we spoke a bunch of times and um i did run into her at the bernie rally when we played that and um yeah, I feel like it really just, especially when I was doing that um, and the the kind of way that that like kind of chance thing has ended up affecting my life. One of the biggest things I always think about with like activism or political involvement is that like there is so much space for for people to do so to do so much good that they don't even know about, you know, like when I started that project it was just because I wanted to do it. You know, it was just because I thought that um, I had some experience doing live events from being at so many shows and playing a lot of shows. And I thought that I had an idea and I thought it was worth pursuing and I, I tried to do it. And because of that, you know, it led to, um, yeah, these some of these really amazing, crazy experiences. And um, I think people think that with activism, that it, you know, is really either kind of has to be stuffy or lame or they don't know how to, they're not sure which kind of level to involve themselves in. And I always just kind of say that like bringing your, bringing your creativity and who you are to that space can only improve it because there is so much room for improvement. You know, there, there, there is an element of like understanding um, the people that we want to elect the people that we are electing and you know there we need to break down the the misunderstanding between the the people that are actually being governed and and who we're electing to govern us um and i think it's going to require a lot of creativity and i think like with aoc I, I would just say that like anyone could do it you know like all you have to do it is is want it bad enough and that goes with music too and this isn't a one side or the other political thing. This is a just political candidates in general is that we need more people who are getting into politics because they're passionate, because they want to make a difference, not because they want the power grab. And yes. I feel that we have too many people in this arena that are there for the power that really don't care about the day to day, you know, constituent, the day to day lives of their constituents. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, like one thing that I think about a lot is, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, in, in, in my New York City public school education, I always had humanities, but, you know, we never had, we were never taught a civics class, you know, oh, there's yeah. a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of systematic ways that people are kept from having access to the knowledge that would give them a better chance of, being able to um, elect people that represent how they feel. And I think that it's, it's, it's something that really, really needs to, really, really has to change. And that was my goal with Anger Can Be Power is trying to, um, especially because we had and, and have a lot of fans who are young girls and kind of in this period in their life when the things that they involve themselves in or that happen can create, um, will shape who you are, you know, can create a lasting impression on your life. And I guess I felt like if I threw these events where I talked to these people and tried to involve um, kind of my musical um, dreams and some of these more activism dreams that I could try to create a situation that was more casual and less like, okay, this is somebody that I see on the news and more like this is somebody that I can ask a question to, you know, and just try to hum humanize it and normalize it and make it feel like, especially for, for teenagers that caring about their surroundings, caring about um, politics as much as <laughs> they can without feeling really scared and really burnt out, which I think is, is really true as well. But, you know, just kind of bringing it, bringing some of that um, pain to the surface, I guess, and, and trying to create a live place where people could understand it together. Yeah. This record came out on mom and pop. Yep. 
And I want to know, why did you guys choose Mom and Pop for this record? Uh, well, um, we're, we're in contract with them. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, you already had previous. It's a record yeah. contract. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 we, we did. Um, they we've been working with them for a few years. They did Twenty Two and Blue as well, and um, our EP King of the Dudes. And they're an amazing independent label from New York City. We're from, you know we're from the city, and a um, lot of yeah, really amazing, hardworking people there. And I think they do something really special with their releases because you know I think they can really see um, the big picture but they know how to nurture you know artists in, in all points of their career so I think they're they're a very they're they're a, a New York staple label yeah and before you were on uh, mom and pop you were on fat possum so you've always been on these kind of like what I would say kind of like bigger indie labels that they're not bigger in terms of size but they're well known I guess yeah you know I uh, have a good reputation. And I'm sure that you've had, you know, um, bigger labels, you know, the Warner people, the Sony people, whatever on your door. Why are you stuck with the smaller labels over the years? I think, you know, um, I mean, the music industry can be really tough. You know, I think that um, there's no real way to protect yourself. I think as as an artist, um, it's something I think about a lot because you know, myself included and a, and a lot of artists that I know um, really are moving and operating with um, just the hope of being understood and having the chance to make their songs and get them out to people and kind of have that level of um, communication. Um, but what you doing over there? Um, changing your string. All right, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, Nick's, Nick's changing his string over there. Um, but, you know, so I think because of that um, real real need to be understood, I think that that does leave artists open to um, being put in worse situations a lot. And a lot of times, like, the, the, the technicalities of how all these things go are very complicated, which is, you know, why I always recommend having a great lawyer, um, if you can, and, and always make sure that you look over everything and talk to a lot of people that you trust. But... You know, I think I, I always, you know, I always, I never saw the music that I was interested in making, being supported at a major label, I guess. I, maybe things have kind of changed now a little bit. And, you know, there is like a wall and there's like a lot of, I think, different structures that people are looking at for how music is released. And I think the next 10 to 20 years are, are going to be, I mean, all eras of, of music and how they're released are interesting, but we're in a particularly interesting place now and we're just going to have to keep seeing how it goes. But I've, I've definitely been lucky to work with, um, with labels who I do think keep art at the forefront and want to, um, you know, give, give their artists that chance. Yeah. Well, you were saying something, I, I, I was just going to say that you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the changing of the music industry. Mm -hmm. And I, we talk about Demi's all about rock is back. She says rock is back a lot on the show and talks about, you know, when we have a, 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 a guitar based band on the, on the show, but it's different now because there's literally major labels scooping up rock bands to, to cash in on a trend, the trend of rock music. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who were singing R and B and hip hop and EDM a year ago are now like doing blink 182 sounding Y2K mm -hmm. emo, you know? So do you feel like on, on one hand, do you feel like we've been here forever on the other hand or like we yeah. need to push the button now because you know, there is a, a, an appetite on top 40 radio for, guitar-based rock music? You know, I think that's that's a big question. I think, you know, something I always think about is like, you know, I think it's really easy for people to hate each other or like point at each other, especially other artists and look at what they have or what they don't have or what they tried and what worked and what didn't work. And I think what really matters is um, a the music that's that's coming out, 
and and be like what it means for the culture. You know, I think that's more important than who is doing it. Also, to get it done on a massive scale requires a ton of infrastructure and a ton of financial backing. Um, you know, from from huge labels in order to actually kind of pull something off. So, whether or not you know you may fully support the people who have necessarily like brought all of this back or be the biggest fans of them. I think it also does create the chance for, you know, these kids that are listening to this music now to have this huge, rich history of rock music to actually pull from and kind of, um, you know, let, let some of these acts that are taking that space right now, uh, create more space for people to ultimately have access to, um, real music, you know? And I do think there's a difference between music um, that feels like it's coming from a genuine place and music that feels like it has been um, created to like sell, make you buy more clothes at H&M, you know, <laughs> or, or buy more food at the grocery store. Like there is like what I would call like music product that is meant to like keep you in a place like buying stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, the and so yeah. What I can I can think of is it kind of reminds me of in the late seventies when disco became big, a lot of bands who weren't doing disco albums, all of a sudden you had Rod Stewart and the Rolling Stones and mm -hmm. Disco Duck and all these people like trying to cash in on disco. And now it feels like people are trying to cash in on rock. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think it just like what, what matters to me more is like is what what music reaches people what are they going to hear and and is it going to become important to them and i i love rock obviously um i do love a lot of um music in the history of rock um and i think that getting that music and getting music that feels real to people and getting them to connect with that rather than music product is more important and i think if that is done with like this version of rock that we're seeing. I think that that's really cool. And, you know, I think that, I mean, again, I think rock always looks cool. I think that it should have a time, you know, and I think that it should have a new time in it. And um, that hopefully a lot of people will win, that hopefully a lot of people who have been putting that time and energy into that space will also get to share in cultures like the culture's renewed interest in it wow so Demi, you want to you want to then i feel like that i'll be like yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, like yeah that was like an applause moment yeah, right now, like, if you were on jimmy <laughs> fallon right now i'd be like yeah yeah <laughs> totally totally all right, Julia, before we go, we got to do a little question and answer game with you, a little rapid fire question and answer. And this very New York centric questions for okay. the most part. So, Demi, you can take it away. And, and when I put it up there, yeah. we'll have no. mm. <laughs> Okay, favorite 2 a.m. food at like which deli? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, there's a new deli on 14th and A that I like a lot. Um, I, I would get um either like hot cheetos and a sparkling ice <laughs> or maybe like um like a like a turkey sandwich okay so she's elegant but she's spicy yeah do you get do you get picky with your deli counter order or are you just like whatever you have because people get angry when there's no banana peppers you know right mm -hmm. i'm definitely not um angry at the selection mm -hmm. i'm i'm very much grateful to be there and grateful that there is a counter and hungry um you know and usually like the 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 older and greasier the the kind of flat top looks the better it will taste i that being said like about two weeks ago i did see a um rat run up the wall from oh, no. behind the flat top um like up up the wall and I, you know, I've seen a, so many rats outside, but it was the first time I saw one inside now they're getting by, the, by the food. And mm -hmm. I feel like that has, you know, made, made me want to go to just the, cause the one on 14th and A is, is pretty new. So I'm hoping the rats don't crawl up the wall there. I've never um, seen so many rats in New York, man. They're getting crazy. 
They're getting strong. They're turning into like Spider Man. They're getting. They're inspired. They're organizing. They're they're yeah. politically organized now. They have their own. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're they're enthralled with yeah. their circumstances. Very yeah. Accurate. Um. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not very picky. I will say I'm. I'm trying to avoid the rats inside. Mm. Yeah. All right. You know, I had to ask NYC. Let's go, baby. Favorite four loco flavor. I will. I haven't drank four loco since the um since the since the change in ingredients. Really? Um, since they took the caffeine out. Um, so what is it? Is it just natural energy? What's the what's well? The so for, I mean, so four loco back when I used to drink it, which was not often because I was underage. My space. Um, uh, you know, so just a few sips here and there. I mean, there, there's what? There's watermelon. There's like lemon. Fruit Maybe there's like a blueberry. The blueberry one. That's one. Blue raspberry. But it, it used to have caffeine in it, along with just like being like ex an extremely toxic beverage that I don't think humans sh should consume. Yeah. Um. But yeah, probably I probably would have had to say watermelon but it's been a long time i, I do not often partake in, in four loco these days yeah, it turned it makes you it made me a crazy person it makes you feel crazy so no, you're twisted Just yeah four percent you know damn yeah. yeah all right beacon's closet or l train vintage like, definitely l train vintage l train vintage all the way forever <laughs> I feel like L Train has better pants, has better like pants selection. Yeah, well, L Train is just, you know, just iconic. Um, you know, there's so many, so many locations, many great prices. Um, you know, I definitely think if you're trying to put together a cool outfit, you're gonna have a better, a better chance at, at L Train. Mm. All right, speaking of L Train vintage, are you a J Train girl? Or are you an L train girl? Well, um, I've I've lived off the L my whole life, actually. Um, but if I had to think of like the best train line, God, I mean, I've taken so many for so long. I think um, if you had like the L train speed on the A train track, that would be like. That would be good. I all. I mean, I do. I do. As someone that hustled around the city a lot, I do love the four, five, six. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really good. I will say that I have had my least favorite train line is the G, but it is. It is improving. I feel like it has made some improvements the past few years. Um, I just remember, like you know, all, also because it's shorter than other trains, so it's mm -hmm. like. If you're, it never comes, it would come like every 15, 20 minutes. And then mm -hmm. if it, you had to, if it came, you had to be in the right spot. Cause sometimes I would like run and like, yeah, mm -hmm. just not make it. Cause it was just too short. And I would just be like cursing, just cursing the G, but now I take it more. And, it's and I feel like the G, the G should connect to, to something more than it does. It feels like, like, cause there's that one where it like connects to the L, but you have to like get out and like walk Metropolitan way around. Yeah, 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 yeah. It takes forever. Yeah. Yeah, there's right. a, you know there's a lot there's a lot of there's a lot of wrong there's a lot of right but you know the G the G does get you where you need to, you know we need the G so I can't talk too too bad about yeah, it we need yeah, them yeah. all. What's a oh. closed venue you miss the most? Well, I mean, I really miss um, you know obviously like two eighty five Death by Audio Ron's Tea House Glasslands like a lot of the kind of really um like og williamsburg the mansion by any chance sorry you this one spot called the mansion maybe i mean there was also um there was um you see him? i mean there were so many there was living bread there was which was like a deli that became a venue at night there was um there was like a party store that used to change there was also a, a venue called um big snow buffalo lodge um, which was awesome. Um, they used to serve like shots in, uh, like little, like little dental cups. Um, <laughs> that was really, really cool. And I, I miss that one a lot. You know someone took that from the dentist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's cousin was a dentist. 
and you know we're just trying to cut that one low cost man yeah yeah there's also um like venues in the city like uh the sidewalk cafe where i played a lot of my first open mics and yeah. uh yeah, we were talking about cake shop, shop earlier yeah, yeah cake shop was, was a big one the living room cake shop when i first started playing i could play at cake shop and then within a couple years um they, they had to really get tight about like underage stuff. And so I could only do shows that were like weekend matinee type things. Um, and so that was harder, but um, I do, I did have some great shows at, at cake shop in the living room. Uh, what's your opinion of Times Square? Is it just tourist yeah. trash or is it like a fun, a, a good enjoyable place to walk around? I mean, I'm not, has anyone said that it is a good place to walk around? I like this. this. So I will stand up for this one. This is my question. Uh -huh. I enjoy sure. when I'm around Midtown and it's night. I yeah. like just like, not for like hours, but for like 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Just walking around, catching it in, getting the, the soaking in the lights, you know. Yeah. I think I think energy. that's the key, that's the key is nighttime. I think if it's yeah. like. Oh yeah. Specifically nighttime. Absolutely. Like midnight or 1 a.m. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would still like keep your wits about you because I feel like people are like wandering in, in a crazy way as they do in most of New York. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely at night or maybe like super, 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 super duper early morning, like maybe like four or 5 a.m. Like see the sunrise Times Square moment. That could be cool, but not yeah. like a, you know, any other time. <laughs> yeah. And our last one here. Do you have a favorite bassist? Oh, yeah. Um, gosh, so many. I would probably say um, right now, like John Entwistle from, from The Who. Um, wow. Definitely, that was one of my um, big inspirations when I was a kid, you know, like watching old videos of, of The Who and, and seeing how he played and especially how he would play like this unbelievable unbelievably difficult riff but just be like looking like casually mm. like to the side like as if it wasn't like the fucking hardest thing ever <laughs> um you know i just always aspired to that level of coolness and i am still hoping to get there <laughs> you're, you're close you're close it's a life a lifelong journey <laughs> all right That'll be it for us. Thank you so much. Uh, no, for thank you show. guys. Thanks for all of your great questions. I hope I hope uh, it was all right. Are you recording something right now? You just at the, at the studio, just kind of chilling out. Well, this is kind of our office. You know, this is kind of like our workspace. So we use it for everything. Whether it's more importantly, does the reel to reel behind you work, or is it just a decoration? It it has worked. It's not in working condition in this moment. Um, but that's good enough. Just, just the idea that it's worked it, recently. Is, it is, can work. It, it has been functional. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah. All right. All well, right. thank you guys. Absolutely. We'll, uh, okay. thank you so much for being here. And of course, um, the new album, uh, uh, head full of sugar is out now. And, uh, yeah. Are you playing shows coming up, Julia? Is, so we're doing, doing um, we're playing uh, in September at Forest Hills for the big climate thing, which I'm, hopefully you guys have heard about. It's going to be a really cool festival. Um, I mean, Cheryl Crow, Courtney Barnett, Heim, The War on Drugs, Guster. Pom -pom Guster? Pod. Yeah, Guster will no. be there. Guster will be Out of there. all those, Guster's yeah. the one that the Demi got excited yeah, about. Yeah, same. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've. I have been a huge Guster fan since I was a kid and um, I've seen, yeah, they've definitely been playing more the past few years. And I saw they were on this festival and I was like, DM them. And I was like, Amsterdam is one of my favorite songs of all time. I really want yeah. to see you. That's like, like yeah. that's like kit drum. That's like kit drum Guster, not like hand drum Guster. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm super excited. Yeah, it'll be great. Mm -hmm. All right, we will really let you go this time. Thank you so much. Right. And uh, good, guys. yeah, we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Julia. Bye. What a legend, Jordan. Unreal. Yeah. Unreal on its real. I do feel, you know, I, I moved to New York in 2017 and Julia was is was like was still it was like it was like the it girl, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Yeah. And when you saw it, she does, Julia does DJ at, at small clubs around New York. And when you, you see it like DJ set, Julia coming, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us. I'm just real with Jordan and Demi. As always, go to popdust.com for past episodes. Check us out on Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts and watch us video versions on YouTube and Facebook watch. Until next time, we'll see you later.